and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Richard Griscom and I am the host for today's talk. The presentation itself will last for approximately 30 minutes and if you're participating in the live webinar you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application. Today's speaker is Dr. Andrew Harvey. Andrew is a junior fellow at the Research Institute for Languages and Cultures of Asia and Africa at Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. His interests include the languages of the Tanzania Rift, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as events through linguistic arts and language contact. Andrew has extensive experience working with the Gorwa community, first as a master's student at the University of Dar es Salaam, then as a grantee of the Endangered Languages Documentation Program and a PhD student at SOAS, and more recently as a recipient of a fellowship from the Firebird Foundation for Anthropological Research. Andrew is also currently working on Ihanzu, an underdescribed Bantu language of the Rift Valley area, and Hadza, a language isolate. Please join me in welcoming Andrew as he gives his talk, the Gorwal Language and Cultural Material Archive, an overview. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for that um, effusive introduction. Um, so, the, uh, the Gorwa Language and Cultural Material Archive is uh, it's a large multimedia documentation of Gorwa language and cultural material. And basically this talk will, I'm aiming to provide an overview of the contents of uh, this collection. I want to uh, give examples of how the collection can be searched and interpreted. And uh, I'd like to suggest some threads running through the collection that might be fruitful for future exploration. So um, first as I guess a little bit of um, context, I'm an early career researcher and as uh, Richard uh, mentioned, I'm currently based at the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. Uh, I've spent uh, time as a student at the University of Dar es Salaam. I did my master's degree as well as at the School of, uh, School of Oriental and African Studies in London where I did uh, my uh, doctoral studies uh, and working with uh, Gorwa all the while. Um, and uh, I began work uh, with Ihanzu towards the end of my doctoral studies. And at basically at the end of the year, I'll be beginning a two-year postdoctoral project at Leiden University in the Netherlands, continuing documentation of Gorwa and Ihanzu, and also beginning work on the language isolate Hadza, as Richard had mentioned. Um, so a little bit of context about uh, the language uh, that I'm talking about today, Gorwa, is um, it's a South Cushitic language uh, of the larger Afro-Asiatic phylum spoken uh, in and around Babati. So by my reckoning, there are a maximum total of around 130,000 people who know Gorwa. Um, with that said, a more nuanced view sees the language probably only actively used by about 80,000 people. So further observation places Gorwa somewhere in the 6B and 7 range on the expanded graded intergener intergenerational disruption scale. So that is in rural areas, uh, the language is being spoken but is being squeezed out of domains by Swahili and uh, numbers over the coming generations will probably decrease numbers of speakers. Uh, in urban areas, the language is, you know, clearly not being used in most cases and uh, is not being passed on to younger, younger generations. Um, so I should note that language dynamics have not um, been an area of formal study for me, and I would really encourage further research on this topic. Um, today's talk will, uh, it'll be made openly accessible. Uh, shortly after it is over, uh, and it will be available to download at the DOI on the screen. Uh, and the video will also be viewable on uh, YouTube at the Rift Valley Network's YouTube channel where we've posted our uh, presentations uh, in the past. Um, so the collection itself, it, the, uh, the Gorwa uh, collection is, is housed at ELAR, uh, the Endangered Languages Archive, part of uh, SOAS, along with deposits large and small from over 400 other languages. So one can see that ELAR hosts several deposits um, 
of Tanzanian languages, uh, notably for us Rift Valley Network uh, members, uh, Richard Griscom's documentation of Isamjeg de Toga, and uh, Alice Mitchell's de Toga material uh, for the Causality Across Languages project. Um, so ELAR, first of all, is a digital archive. This means that it does not host physical documents and artifacts like a more traditional archive uh, akin to the image to the left here, um, but rather all of ELAR's materials are electronic. Uh, that is sound, video, image, and various text files. So more like the image to the right of the screen. Uh, so altogether, the Gorwa collection currently contains sound and video files from approximately 256 hours of recordings. There's about 10 hours of consent uh, recordings. Uh, there's about 66 hours of elicitation. It's about 13 hours of prompted speech and around 166 hours of natural speech recordings. We'll get into the meaning of these different kinds of recordings in a moment, uh, but first I'd like to show a breakdown of what was recorded when. So what you can see here is an interesting story. It's a stacked bar graph showing the minutes recorded month on month from when the project started in October of 2012 through to July of 2018. Uh, I should make clear that data collection continues and therefore the material will continue to be added to this collection, but um, that for this presentation, the data taken into account uh, for our tabulations is uh, for the month, for the months displayed uh, on this graph. So this first section represents the portion of data collection carried out during my master's studies at the University of Dar es Salaam. Uh, so you can see that most of my time was spent tackling the rudiments of the language, mainly through elicitation, as well as non-data related activities like meeting people, getting established in the community, uh, etc. The second section here is data collected during doctoral studies uh, while funded by the Endangered Languages Documentation Project, DLDP, as Richard mentioned at the beginning. So data volume is clearly higher with, elicita with elicitation still forming an important part of the research um, as sort of dictated by uh, the topic that I was uh, undertaking for my dissertation. Um, and then natural speech is taking a larger proportion as well. Um, the uh, last three months represent work carried out as part of a project funded by the Firebird Foundation for Anthropological Research. So here I'm working with a team of four local researchers and much of the natural speech data comes from them with a bit of elicitation from me. Uh, data collection with this particular project continued until the beginning of this, this month, May uh, 2019. Um, in terms of how my data is treated, I recognize three main steps in my workflow. That's processed, transcribed, translated, and annotated. So processed work is material which has simply been taken from the audio recorder and video camera and put into a single folder, as well as given a unique identifying number. So all material deposited in the archive uh, has necessarily been processed. Um, the next step is transcribed, translated. Um, so this material has been given a transcript, often simply written as my local research assistants hear it, and as they feel intuitively, they should write it. And uh, it's given a Swahili language translation. So you can see here in the pane or the picture to our right here, you can see uh, that there's a transcribed translated file. Uh, there's a rough Gorwa transcription on the line highlighted in red, and uh, a Swahili transcription of each utterance now highlighted in red underneath. So at this material, uh, or at this stage, the material is probably usable by people who want to access the material for their narrative content, if not their linguistic content, uh, provided, of course, uh, they can read uh, Swahili. Um, the next step, the final step, is uh, annotated material. So this represents uh, the final stage in the workflow in which the recordings receive a standardized Gorwa transcription based on working Gorwa orthography I've been using for the project, uh, an English translation, and a timeline linguistic annotation in which utterances are parsed and glossed 
basically according to my best understanding of the language at the time. So here uh, on the picture to the right of an annotated um, file, the same actual file that I showed before, um, is uh, a standardized Gorwa transcription. So this is highlighted in red here, uh, based on a working Gorwa orthography. It's a little bit smushed up here. You could expand the pane and you'd see those full words there. Um, you also get um, it broken apart into um, broken apart into part of speech tags. So each of these uh, each of these sections is given a part of speech tag, according to my understanding. And uh, right at the bottom, uh, you can hardly see it there, but there's an English translation um, for each utterance, and it's obviously broken apart into utterances or into breath groups. So at this point, the material would be usable by anybody who is literate in English, as well as by linguists who are not necessarily familiar with South Cushitic. Um, so in terms of workflow status, it's, it's a good way of measuring the material that we have in uh, the uh, collection, in the archived collection. So of the, uh, of the elicitation, uh, so there were 66 hours of, elic of elicitation uh, carried out, um, 15 hours have been transcribed and translated. Uh, and of these uh, 15 hours, uh, all of this has been annotated. So most of this work was carried out as part of, of uh, my doctoral dissertation. Uh, much of the untouched or just simply processed material is lexical. Um, so aside from just brute time that this might take to work through, it wouldn't uh, require too much experience in Gorwa to treat. So this material would also be ideal for something like a talking dictionary. So in that processed material, but that untranscribed, translated, or annotated material, uh, there's considerable, um, there's a project there. So uh, that's uh, quite exciting, I think. And it could be taken on by, uh, by anybody, not necessarily just uh, me. Um, so of the 13 hours of prompted speech, and again, we'll get into defining what this is in a moment. Um, so of the 13 hours of prompted speech that were recorded, there's about 4.5 hours that have been transcribed and translated. And of those 4.5 hours, there's been about one hour that's been annotated. Um, of the natural speech uh, data, there's around 26, so of the 166 hours, around 26 hours of those have been transcribed, translated. And of those 26 hours, around two have been fully annotated. So as can be seen, uh, especially in this case, but in each of the cases beforehand, uh, because each step requires a finer and finer level of analysis, the output becomes smaller and smaller. And this uh, speaks to what's been referred to as the transcription bottleneck. And it's uh, been recently discussed, discussed in the language documentation literature. Um, so in my case, there are currently four people who are trained in and who are working on transcription and translated, and, or sorry, on transcription and translation. But um, as of present, the only person who can annotate this material is me. Um, and uh, of course, I should put out here that I'm very interested in training people, uh, training more people uh, to do this and getting more people interested uh, in this part of the project. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things there to learn and uh, it can't simply be done uh, by one person. Um, so uh, returning to the nature of these different kinds of recordings, I've mentioned consent and I've mentioned prompted speech versus natural speech. Let's actually break that down and talk about what that contains. Um, so um, I'd like to give a brief uh, explanation now of the categorizations and also what is found inside. So first we'll look at consent, uh, which is uh, the material which is in blue here uh, in these uh, graphics below. So the graphic on the left is the total amount in the archive and the graphic on the right is what was recorded when uh, each month during the project thus far. So the consent is the blue material. So essentially the consent is the most uniform of the data and consists of recordings of either myself or a local researcher verifying with a language consultant if they agree to having their voice recorded and or their image captured, that they understand what it will be used for and that they know they're free to stop at any time. So ba it's based largely on the consent dialogue sample from uh, Claire Bowen's uh, Field Methods book. And uh, it was decided that uh, consent be recorded orally rather than in writing, which seemed to be the medium which was more meaningful in the Gorwa context. Uh, so important uh, details here in this uh, consent dialogue. Um, 
which I've included in an appendix of my dissertation, um, is uh, payment rates, explaining that individuals are free to stop at any time, um, asking them whether they want their names used or whether they want to remain anonymous, and also uh, spending a little bit of time, you know, maybe unscripted, but spending a little bit of time uh, to describing what an archive is and uh, what making uh, their material available on the internet would mean, uh, and whether they agree to having their recording archived and uh, made available uh, in the future for other users. So that's basically the um, consent dialogue. And that's conducted either in Swahili or uh, if we're dealing with uh, Gorwa monolinguals, of which there are very, very few uh, indeed. But if we're dealing with people who are more comfortable in Gorwa, uh, it'll be uh, conducted in Gorwa. Moving on to um, elicitation, which is represented here by the green color uh, on the left, uh, the total material in the archive, and on the right, what was recorded when. Um, of all the data recordings, this is the most formalized. That is, it's, it's, the, the speaker is the most constrained here. So this includes different kinds of elicitation. Uh, one, for example, is uh, uh, translation. So including you know, simple phrases like this. So in which I gave a Swahili sample sentence and it was given back to me uh, in Gorwa. And uh, then of course there's uh, examples like uh, data manipulation. Uh, so uh, here it's a longer exercise in which I look for compounds by playing around with the grammar of an example. So uh, let's see if we can get that. uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So that's an example of um, data manipulation, so sort of playing around with uh, an example and seeing uh, what uh, I can do with it and what other, uh, what the speakers can do with it. Um, and then there's back translation, so in which I present uh, a Gorwa sentence and uh, it was given back to me in Swahili. Nikisama kariandi na tlaanorga kariandir na tlaanorga Ion Ariandi Nina Tanor Gas Namanake Ki a Kibuyu Ime Uawa Ime Vunjua Na Jiwe A Jiwe Nikito Ambacho Ime 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 Ua Latte Ime Anguka Yenewe Hata Eh Ariandi Mila Misagua Tano Inaga Tano Nahu Tano Kuna Kwa Nikisema Ariandi in a Tano Ga Okay, so uh, that's an example of uh, back translation, uh, getting judgments, but also getting the Swahili uh, translations and, uh, and volunteer in different forms. So these are all different types of elicitation that feature uh, within that categorization. Prompted speech, uh, which is represented here by the red color, is a material uh, within which the speech is naturalistic but it's within a highly structured context, uh, such as a contrived experiment or task. Um, so this includes things like stimulus tools and semi-structured interviews. So uh, stimulus tools like this video using Sophie Safnard's Block Worlds uh, stimulus tool has one speaker describe an unseen model to another speaker. Uh, so there's like a little house there made with bricks and there's a divider between the two. So the second speaker is trying to construct it on the other side of a barrier. So here you can see Shadrach and Hezekiah uh, trying out Sophie's block worlds. Hi. Hey. 
قلت لها انا تعرف؟ ايه انا حفا يوم سيدي زي لغنينا لغاقوا اه سيدي زي الا برا حيسي اغا سيدي زي او ايه اغا سيدي قلت لها ريعا ايه الا فو ارداعا قاسي مبرتقا يا ارادا القوا مبرتقا ايه ارداعا ارغوما مرداعا ارغوما مرداعا ايه so um, similarly, we have semi-structured interviews, including uh, predetermined questions. They're also included here in prompted speech, simply because you, you get different things here. It's a, it's a different kind of uh, data in the end. Um, so natural speech here represented by the purple is the single largest and uh, the most heterogeneous type of data. So basically it includes any sort of speech in which the situation has not been contrived by the researcher. So this includes monological texts, uh, monological speech in which uh, there's only one speaker. So an example here being Andrea showing me a type of fruit called tambau. <laughs> so for me here in the end, he finishes by describing it as nuk which is supposedly quite sweet. Now I would rather call it qarqar, which is bitter, but I'll, I'll leave that to him. He's the expert there. Um, so it also includes conversational speech, uh, conversational texts. So uh, um, uh, intuitively that involves at least two interlocutors, uh, like the one here in which Ako Behero and Ako Bu go over the finer points of an origin story with uh, Pascal. <laughs> <laughs> so um, moving from that, there's a, a special sort of conversational speech involves the diviner reading stones uh, to uh, determine the prospects of a client. So in this case, uh, the interlocutors are actually the diviner speaking with the stones, which give responses based on their various configurations. So um, another type of natural speech is uh, the ritual text. So natural in the sense that it is not constrained in any way by the researcher, but ritual in the sense that basically the content is largely fixed by convention. Uh, so this includes traditional stories, riddles, and in this case, songs. So this one was recorded at a beer party in Hoshan in 2015. <laughs> So other materials uh, in the archive uh, collection include images. Uh, so that could be photos of participants, such as this one of Ama Mando Osilo taken in 2016, actually on my birthday in 2016. Uh, photos of artifacts, so including this photo of Uai de Emai's uh, musical bow, uh, along with his son. Uh, and photos of plants, uh, often uh, associated with 
earlier recordings of uh, descriptions of how they're used or where they're found, etc. Um, songs with no words or dancing with no words is usually classed as instrumental or ethnographic. So the project has thus far included 126 participants, though I would estimate that around 10% of participants account for around 75% of the data. Um, 88 of the participants were men or, and boys, and uh, 38 were women and girls. So the, uh, the, the sex bias here is down to several reasons, uh, not the least of which being that I myself am a man and that Gorwa society is quite patriarchal. Um, the oldest speaker estimated that he was born in 1912 and the youngest in 2003. Um, so of all of the participants, seven were uh, monolingual uh, Gorwa, which is incredibly rare these days. Uh, 98 uh, were bilingual in Gorwa and Swahili, and there were 21 participants who uh, could speak three or more uh, languages, typically Swahili, followed by another uh, language uh, spoken in the area. Uh, such as Rangi, Iraq, Alagua, one of the Datoga uh, varieties, or Nyaturu, or um, a language of education and uh, commerce, like English, for example. Um, so in the preceding sections, I talked about what is actually in the archived collection. I'd now like to talk about how to use the archive collection. So this is an image of the landing page of the collection. So the URL above will lead you here. Um, it has some different sections, including a title header, uh, a map with a pin giving the approximate location of where the language is spoken, uh, some brief information to act as an introduction to the deposit, and the search menu, which will be the focus of um, our attention. So zooming in on the search menu, uh, we see some different components. And I'd like to focus first on the search box at the very top. So let's use this recording, one in which Akko Bu talks about the colonial era forest clearing projects. Uh, so let's use that as an example. So say we want to access this recording, uh, the video and its associated transcriptions, translations, and, and, and annotations. So this can be done in several ways, and it depends on how you encounter uh, the reference to the material, how you want to search for it. Um, so say we come across the data in this way, in which the story be is being discussed as part of an article. Um, the name of the story occurs several times, so uh, let's search for it. We'll go back to uh, the search menu on the deposit page, highlighted in red here, and we'll enter the title Pakani, uh, written to our left here. When we hit search, we'll receive a couple of responses uh, in which the search term Pakani is highlighted by the system in yellow. Uh, and, up, and upon reading further, we'll see that the first result highlighted here in red is the one that we're looking for. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, we come across data in a different way, say as a cited example sentence in a given, in a, in a given in a grammar, so here highlighted in red, once again we can search uh, in the same way. So back to the archives uh, collection search menu, uh, we can input the unique identifier given with the sentence. Um, and this will once again bring us to the same bundle highlighted in red here. Other search methods are available. So for perhaps, for example, we're looking for a story, any story. We could consult the genres uh, section of the search menu highlighted here in red. So we see that there's more options, so we can click to expand. And this will give us uh, all of the different genres for which data has been tagged in the archived deposit. So if we click monological text here highlighted in red, that seems like it's a good bet for stories. It'll take us to all the results, every recording session that has been identified as a monological text. Um, so here to the left, highlighted in red, we can see a total of 99 items. And if we scroll down far enough, our story will be here. And uh, we can continue looking through the results by using the arrows at the bottom. Um, returning to our search menu, we can also search by topic here highlighted in red. So topics here are categories that run throughout the deposit. They may be a subset within a genre, or they may bring together material from different genres. So if we click more and expand the topic tab, we see that there's a long list including things like open categories. This is used to identify a subset of elicitation recordings I made specifically about nouns, 
verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. Um, and these topics here refer to prompted speech recordings that use these books as stimuli. So for example, recordings that used uh, the field guide Birds of East Africa um, by Steven Stevenson and Fanshawe, uh, those are all uh, given a topic. Um, so for example, uh, we also uh, have received history as a topic, so that draws together all the material, including history that was not experienced directly by the person recounting it, but perhaps passed on from parents or through oral tradition. Returning to our uh, search results, we can now open one of these bundles to see its contents. Uh, we'll try uh, our favorite one here, highlighted again in red. So when we click on it, it brings us to the bundle page, that is the page where all the files and information about one particular recording is kept. So there are two major sections, uh, the bundle information highlighted here in red and the bundle resources. So we'll start with the information. So here's all the metadata about the bundle and it should give us a good idea of what the sound, video and transcription files contain. So there's a title, um, the name given to the recording or the story, the unique identifying number, which we encountered uh, in the past, um, the participants, including uh, the speaker uh, or speakers or the person who transcribed or translated the recordings. And what's, uh, yeah, what's interesting about this, I think, is if you click on the uh, individual name, it'll bring up all the recordings in which they played a role. Um, we also have uh, the description. So this is the main text here. It has several subparts itself. It includes a brief English precy of what the recording is about. Uh, there's a Swahili translation of that precy. There's explicit directions for how to attribute a recording. So basically I treat materials in the archive as chapters in a volume. So every recording is cited with two lines, one crediting those who worked on the recording and uh, one crediting the curator of the deposit. And again, every piece of data includes exactly how it can be cited. So it makes reuse simple, I would hope. Um, the same conditions of usage, which is essentially open, but must cite origin and uh, not to use the data for harm or disrespect, etc. cetera. Um, some descriptions also include specific links. Uh, so unique identifiers of recordings that may be of further interest or use. So here, uh, for example, are other versions of a story as well as recordings that are continuations of that story. Um, the section of the bundle page containing the data is relatively straightforward. Um, so what we have is note that first and foremost, the material is unrestricted, meaning that it can be viewed or listened to and downloaded by anyone. Uh, this includes the audio and the video here, which actually can be listened to uh, from the deposit. Uh, it's almost like YouTube. Uh, and uh, less importantly, the PFXX uh, file, as well as the EAF file. Um, so files, uh, EAF files with the unique identifying number and the flex designation have been annotated. And the reason that it says flex is because I use the flex software to do that. Uh, but you open it up in Elon. Um, and uh, EAF, again, refers to files created on the ALON annotation software, which can be downloaded at the Language Archive Tools section by following the link here. Um, so this is a view of an ALON file. It's not the first time that I've pulled one up in this presentation uh, when it's opened. Uh, so ALON uh, also can export its text cont uh, contents to several other formats. So it's worth exploring. Uh, it's a free download. So it's, uh, yeah, it's worth exploring to uh, get the material. Uh, returning quickly to the unique identifying number. So in my work, uh, it's common to uh, see references in which uh, the number is given, uh, al actually, which is an alphanumeric code. It contains letters as well, followed by another number to the right of a full stop. Um, so the number, this number here, the, the number to the right of the full stop corresponds to the utterance within the annotation. And so returning to ALON, we will see that it can be located by looking on the line labeled phrase segment number. And once found, it can be listened to either in isolation or within its larger context. Um, again, all of these materials are open to be downloaded and used. Uh, so returning to the description, we see another section titled keywords. Um, so written larger up here, just blown up so it's easier for us to see. They serve different functions, three of which we see here. So 
here, these keywords, colonial administration and chiefs, um, uh, what we see is uh, they function as very specific tags which bring together subtopics that are sort of on a finer level than those available in the topic section. So these might be included under history or given history, but the ones that specifically deal with colonial administration will have a tag. Um, so there are also keywords for places. So every recording has a place keyword referring to where the recording was made. And clicking on that keyword will give you all, re all the recordings which have been made in that place. Uh, so it could be useful if you're looking at you know, variation, et cetera. Uh, deposit 404 status keywords can be used to access all recordings of a certain level of completion, again, as I'd mentioned above. So clicking on this one will bring up all recordings which have been given a standardized transcription and English translations of gloss and a gloss. Essentially, these correspond to the workflow stages described above. And finally, we will turn to talking about the kinds of research that this collection may be used for. So essentially, this is only restricted to the imagination and uh, creativity of the user, but I'll provide some ideas. Um, so once again, looking at that proportion of elicitation material that has been left to be uh, processed, we can see that lexicographic, and as I mentioned, a lot of this is lexicographic material, it's word lists and it's, it's eliciting uh, particular lexical items. Uh, so, uh, you know, anybody who uh, is interested in looking at lexicography, either from a theoretical or from a practical perspective, uh, this would be great data to uh, open up and look at. And I'd have no problem chatting with somebody about that. Also, there are other particular um, things. I mean, all the material is, uh, is, uh, is um, oral, so uh, it's all done in recording. So, you know, you have these phonetic features or, or you know, uh, phonetic morphological features like reduplication. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, ready to be looked at. I think it would be a very uh, interesting uh, topic uh, that you could use the, uh, the uh, archive to uh, explore. Also, language attitudes and perceptions. I did uh, a large sort of language conference uh, early on in the project, and I also held several focus groups, essentially just asking people, what do you feel about the language? What, how do you feel about it? What do you think about its usages, um, et cetera? So, I mean, these could be looked at um, for a study or to support a study that looks at language attitudes. And uh, so this was a general session. I also did a session with some teenage uh, boys um, and I did a session with some older uh, ladies, uh, some older women as well. So, um, you know, I think it would be interesting to compare and to contrast and uh, to use this as, as a, you know, as a sociolinguistic uh, resource. Other stuff, maybe a little bit outside of uh, the bailiwick of, of, of linguists, is, but not entirely uh, unrelated, is things like ethnomusicology. You can see that out of all the topics here highlighted in red in the image there to our right, songs are actually the most uh, common. So what I have, you know, there's, there's songs, there's hundreds, you know, hundred songs or more, uh, as well as discussions uh, about the meaning of these songs, how they were learned, um, when they're used for, etc., cetera, um, and any material that the singer uh, might uh, want to add. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of information there if people would like to look at, uh, you know, songs in Gorwa. There's a lot of different types and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the words have already been transcribed and uh, translated. Um, also things like uh, regional history. Uh, there's been some interviews, um, there've been some interviews about, um, you know, the, uh, the hereditary chiefdom. So here we see a picture of uh, Dodod Uwo, who was uh, the final uh, hereditary uh, chief of the Gorwa who, who held uh, political power um, before, the chief, uh, before the chiefdoms were, uh, were abolished uh, after uh, Uhuru or Tanzanian independence. Uh, so we have pictures uh, we also have interviews with family members or also non-family members talking about uh, the ruling class, but also we have uh, discussions about clans, their origins, their histories, their roles in Gorwa society. And uh, we also have things like life histories, people talking about their lives or the lives of their parents. Um, so there's a lot of interesting material there. And things like ethnography as well. I mean, cultural practices are included there, songs, uh, beliefs. Uh, we have some nice uh, recordings on how uh, elders believe Gorwa people should conduct themselves in society. 
uh, discussions about particular cultural practices such as leveret unions um, and things like that. So we have a lot of uh, interesting material inside of the collection. And uh, going back, I mean, uh, right now, uh, some of the material is being used by a larger uh, linguistics project called um, Doreco. And uh, basically it's taking um, some material that has been archived from lesser spoken languages. Uh, so including Gorwa and also uh, including Richard uh, Griscom's uh, uh, Datoga material. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's mainly a phonetic phonological analysis of pausa but also I think things like morpheme density as well. So I mean, this just simply is an exciting uh, proof of concept that um, this material from small languages when it's archived and, and, uh, and processed, um, I think perspicuously enough, uh, it can be used and it can be brought to, the lar brought to bear on uh, the larger um, discipline of linguistics. Um, and of course, once again, in terms of larger prospects, what we see here is, uh, you know, this, uh, this chart here could actually be extended by a full nine months, um, full of more natural speech from actual local researchers, local language researchers. So I'm quite excited to see the material there. I mean, naturally, um, uh, the local researchers are fluent in the language. They're also fluent in the culture. People are more comfortable with them. They, uh, they have their own curiosities and interests. So the natural speech that should come out of uh, the six months or the nine months uh, that have just passed, I think should be very, very interesting and, uh, and uh, useful for a whole bunch of different uh, reasons. And of course, the, uh, the ELDP follow-on uh, will occur uh, at the beginning of, uh, or at the end of uh, this year as well. So um, there's more material to be added. Um, and of course, you know, prospects for the future include this idea of, you know, bringing the archive to the Gorwa people. How do we go about this? I mean, we have examples from programs such as the Breath of Life in, uh, that was done in North America in which uh, native speakers of, um, of languages in North America were um, given some instruction on how to actually use uh, their uh, archive materials uh, of their, uh, of their um, mother tongues uh, specifically for uh, pedagogy, I think, but I think that there are there are things that we could learn from that. Also, the uh, idea from Umara and Gudarama, uh, the jukebox archive, in which basically a computer uh, is set up in a uh, in a local community, and uh, it's filled with sound and video files, so individuals can look uh, and can uh, access the material. And also, I think Martin Mouse's um, recent uh, Iraq Texts and Society project is interesting. So they they take recorded texts and uh, put it on YouTube with um, Swahili and uh, hopefully soon English translation. So it's another interesting way of uh, still respecting the orality of a, of a culture and bringing those recordings f you know, into a very uh, widely accessible format. Um, so to conclude, I mean, really the sky is the limit. Um, and uh, I think, at least I hope, by uh, describing uh, the basic functionality and contents of uh, this archive that I've um, raised uh, some curiosity. I have uh, raised awareness about and I've hopefully enabled or at least begun to enable people to navigate um, this archive and make use of material that has been recorded hopefully for the wider use of uh, linguists, of uh, wider uh, academia, uh, and especially uh, for uh, local individuals. Thank you, and uh, here are my references. All right, thank you, Andrew, for this very informative presentation. Uh, I think we can now begin the uh, question and answer section. So if anyone would like to ask Andrew a question or offer a comment, you can do so using the uh, Zoom chat module. Uh, I guess I, I will start. I have a uh, well, I have a comment and a question. First, I think this is uh, really insightful uh, to get such a detailed analysis of the contents of an archive because it's not something that is uh, typically discussed. And I think it's, um, it's very helpful uh, just to see all of the, the steps involved on an explanation of all of the, the different kinds of data that are, are present within the archive deposit. Um, so thank you for that. And I have one uh, question. Um, my question is about the uh, local researchers. So I'm wondering if you could 
uh, just talk a little bit more about um, who the local researchers were, how uh, they were identified, or um, how their participation was enlisted, and what sort of training they received. Um, and then also, um, I believe there was a, an advisory committee of some sort that was also helping to kind of guide or advise uh, progress for the uh, Firebird uh, project. So I was just wondering if you could uh, speak a little bit more to, to those two topics. I think that, um, and, and thank you for your question and, uh, and uh, comments, uh, Richard. I, I think that um, a good way to frame this is uh, with this project, it's kind of been a slow and steady sort of seeding of the research agenda from the linguist who at the beginning, I mean, I held all of the, all of the power sort of in the relationship in which you know, I was the one who made up the questions. I was the one who conducted the research. I was the one who decided what would or would not be recorded. And, you know, what sort of occurred after more and more time, you know, spent with the community and speaking to people about their needs and what they're interested in and, you know, the really good, interesting stuff that they would like to include and that they would like to contribute is that it would make sense to involve more local people in those decisions. So, you know, what should I be recording? That was very, very early on uh, in my, uh, in my uh, doctoral uh, data collection. Um, I, for, I, I, uh, I sort of enlisted the help of um, basically some, some well-connected local um, adults, um, older uh, individuals, be they pastors or be they just well-connected uh, elders in the community. And, you know, we sat together uh, once every month or so. And, you know, I'd tell, talk to them about my progress, what I recorded, et cetera. And uh, they said, yeah, I mean, this sounds interesting. You know, you, you should, you, if you're doing stories, you th should think about going to, you know, so-and-so who lives here. I have his phone number or I know his son. Let's uh, set up a meeting. And, you know, they helped me meet people, but they also said, you know, what should be included uh, in the archive. They said, listen, like you can't do a Gorba archive without including the songs or which, you know, I hadn't really given much thought to um, originally, or you can't, you know, you can't study the Gorwa language without studying our riddles. And that resulted in recording, you know, a huge number of really interesting uh, riddles, uh, which I think is, you know, it's, it's another thing that I wouldn't have seen. Or, you know, talk to us about, uh, talk to us about this situation, uh, you know, these different marriage uh, rituals or land ownership arrangements. I mean, you know, these are things that, uh, you know, someone from outside the culture would never have, uh, would never have noticed. So, you know, the, fir the actual first thing uh, that was set up was this, uh, was this advisory committee. Um, and sort of as time went on, I realized that it was going to take all of my time to transcribe and translate this material. Not a, I'm not a native speaker. The language, at least at that point, early on and into the middle of my, uh, of my doctoral studies, was still quite opaque. Listening to it and being able to write it down would take hours and hours. So I would often have to sit down with one of my consultants and instead of adding, you know, an hour or two hours of natural speech or, or uh, elicitation, we would just be doing transcription. Now it's also worthwhile sitting down with people and doing transcriptions. You learn what people include and don't include. But in terms of getting that critical volume of translation and transcription, uh, again, the advisory committee sat down. They said, well, maybe you should think about, you know, hiring some people, hiring some young guys who, 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 uh, you could teach computers to, um, and then get them to use this software. And I thought it was a brilliant idea, you know. Um, There's a lot of young people in the community who were starting to get interested. Um, and so it was basically, again, through, through using uh, the contacts available with the um, advisory committee, it was, um, you know, finding two at the beginning and then uh, people who could, you know, learn the computers. And so they were each given a computer and, you know, we'd give them the sound files and they'd sit down and work through them. They were paid a salary for the number of hours they'd worked. Um, and now it's expanded to four. So these were people who were originally doing translation and transcription. Uh, and when the Firebird project uh, expanded, I'd spoken to them in advance. I said, listen, are you interested in, you know, using these recordings and things, right? You know, are you interested in using these recorders and uh, going out and actually doing the work that I was doing? And they said, yeah, this would be really, uh, really great. So probably over the, over the course of maybe three weeks to one month uh, in Tanzania during the beginning of that Firebird project, actually last summer, um, I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, we get together for a few days, one or two days, three days every week, and uh, we go over, okay, how do we use this equipment? How do we turn on a camera? 
Uh, how do we use a tripod? Um, what are we looking for when we make a recording? We're not going in and doing a documentary, so we don't want to zoom in and zoom out all the time. And it was basically some light training in how to use a camera, how to use uh, a recorder, um, where do you point the recorder, where do you put it, how do you pay attention to where the sound is coming from, and uh, a lot of um, discussion about how do we make sure that we don't lose our data, how do we back it up, how do we put it all in the same place. So now the, now the local researchers, you know, they're uh, recording their own metadata and sending it to me every week. They record it on sheets of paper and they send me photographs in, the e in email. Um, so I know what they're recording. Uh, I got a hard drive full of wonderful material that they'd recorded over three months. I got it close to Christmas, actually. Wonderful Christmas gift. Um, and so now, I mean, the, the, the project is basically run and led by, led by local people following their own research agenda and, and, and research uh, interests. I hope that wasn't super, uh, I hope that wasn't too long. I hope that kind of answered your question. Oh yeah, great, thanks. Um, we have uh, another question uh, from Augustino Emos Caguema. Um, Augustino writes, great Andrew, I would like to know how was your field experience at the beginning of the project in terms of community attitude towards your project? This is interesting, and I mean, I guess I could talk about that for ages and ages, but um, I, think that, I think that in the beginning, it was really trying to be very explicit about what my intentions were, because I think that the Gorwa people have, have had, you know, a variety of different experiences with um, foreign researchers and uh, especially with white people in the past. So I think that, you know, you could see in, the, in, the, in that graphic, actually, I'll go back to it. You can see in the graphic that a lot of my time at the very beginning did not have much actual linguistics involved maybe, you know, learning the language and things like that, but it w was often a lot of just sitting with people and getting to know them and talking with them. Now, this sounds like it's, you know, it's what a luxury. The guy had so many months to sit down and do this, but I think at a certain level, we need to prioritize that at the beginning of a long-term project because, you know, if people believe that you're there from some, for some sort of alternate motive, and I mean, it can be very easily extrapolated from a, a guy walking around with recorders and cameras, um, you know, uh, I think it's, I think, you know, if you, if you have people who have their second doubts or if they have their second guesses, then, you know, the amount that people are going to open up to you and the amount that they're going to contribute from an honest, you know, um, from an honest, honestly, you know, sort of good or, or open-hearted sort of way, I think is, is going to be affected. So spend a lot of time just, you know, just being with people and talking with people and eventually, you know, uh, I feel like, you know, you make these connections on a personal level and people stop doing it from a, oh, Andrew, the researcher perspective, but they do it from, you know, Andrew, our friend perspective or Andrew, our colleague perspective. Um, and so I think that, that you know, uh, it, wasn't an, it wasn't a love story from the beginning, I think, even though people were incredibly hospitable. I mean, you know, as most Tanzanians are, um, just incredible hospitality and, uh, and attentiveness towards uh, newcomers, especially foreigners. Um, but I think to build that genu genuine trust took a long time and it takes a long time. I mean, if I go to a new community, even today, a lot of my time is still spent sitting down with people, sitting down with the, uh, sitting down with the Mwenye Kitty, the chairman of, of the village, or sitting down with the secretary and explaining my intentions and you know, bringing people who've, who, who I've worked with in the past and it will always be that, I think. And, uh, you know, and I think that that's going to be a cornerstone of any sort of, uh, of, any sort of um, work. Great, thank you. Well, I have, of course, many questions. I could <laughs> continue for a long time as well. Let's see, I'll try and choose just one. Um, okay, so you mentioned um, it, it, the, uh, the annotation stage of, of data processing. Uh, that you would make updates to the orthographic transcriptions. And this is something that I myself have been puzzling over a little bit because uh, oftentimes when you're doing parsing and glossing, you're able to update your transcriptions because there's a, a, a lexicon of some kind, like a parsing lexicon. Uh, but that's not always the case for the orthographic forms. So uh, do the orthographic transcriptions have to be updated manually or is there some sort of uh, automated process for that? It's all manual at this point, Richard. So what I do is I sit down with these, I sit down with these first pass, um, I, these first pass um, rough 
uh, transcriptions uh, using whatever uh, writing um, my local researchers uh, find, you know, so all of them have a slightly different system. But I mean, as, as a linguist, that's kind of half, half your job, right? I mean, that's the linguist's job is to sit down and to, okay, figure out how to, how to standardize this stuff. I mean, you know, the language doesn't have a standardized writing system. And it's not for me to tell people how to write the language nor to inculcate them with any sort of system. I try and uh, I try and encourage them to be consistent within their own system, and then I sit down and I actually uh, will go through the recordings and in creating that second pass. So I'll archive the stuff that's been written by the local researchers. At least that's what I'm doing now. So I archive that. So the Swahili transcriptions and their um, and their um, their individual uh, Gorwa transcriptions are preserved because if you look at um, if you look at recent writing. Uh, coming from, for example, Himmelman uh, this past year uh, in an edited volume, he says that there's a lot of value actually to looking at what um, native people, uh, native speakers uh, transcribe and translate when they're writing their own language. What did they put in? What did they put out? He said that this could be a whole other field of, uh, of linguistics looking at this stuff. So we preserve that, we archive that, um, but then I sit down and I actually make a pass on my own and that can, it's quite time uh, intensive. It takes a very long time, first of all, to make this um, consistent with how uh, with how uh, my uh, my my parser would work. Um, but it's important as well. I think that it helps. It you know, I mean, one benefit to it. Uh, the drawback is time, but one benefit is that it that it helps you become very very intimate with the recordings themselves and uh, you know the, the 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 grammatical constructions inside of them. You know, you're, you're working through this, you're sifting through it every day. So you see these things and you get familiar with the grain of the language. I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, no, it definitely did. No, thank you. Okay. Um, well, I think that's all of the questions that we have for today. Uh, so just briefly, I'd like to announce the next presentation in our webinar series, which I will also post in the chat module. Uh, so the next presentation uh, will be by Helen Eaton of SIL Tanzania. Uh, the title of the talk is Sandawe as a Linguistic Island, Distinctiveness in Diversity. And the talk will take place on Wednesday, June 12th, at the same time as this presentation. And the uh, URL for the Zoom meeting is uh, there in the chat box. It will also be shared on the RVN um, uh, newsletter. Uh, also, I'd like to share the link for our YouTube channel, just as uh, Andrew did in his presentation. Uh, this YouTube channel is where we're posting recordings of all of the presentations in the webinar series. All right, uh, thank you again, everyone, for participating, and I look forward to seeing you again at our next webinar.